Yeah, so Stephen, hello. Um, <laughs> and I'm um, glad to be here with you, George. Great. Um, so for those who perhaps aren't familiar with ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, right. how would you describe it, um, perhaps as it relates to um, other therapies or, and yeah, the, 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 how, how you describe it, its development and the context in which it came? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it's acceptance and commit therapy. It's also acceptance and commitment training and, and that either it's act in either case. And the reason that I'm adding that little uh, bit is that while it's best known as a psychotherapy, really what I've always been interested in is just how to empower people's lives. And I came out of a time when there was an idea that we might be able to do that by knowing enough about basic principles that you could scale up into human complexity. And so the wing that I came out of was trying to do that largely out of animal learning principles, a little bit of evolutionary science. Sometimes the evolutionists didn't understand that, but that was true. But it turns out what you and I are doing is not what the bird outside the window is doing. There has been, it's not a break. I mean, it's part of a evolution of life on earth, but we're doing some pretty unusual things. We're doing it right now. And so is everybody listening. Well, what are those things? And that has always been a central issue in psychology, and you need to know it if you want to do something to change folks. And it wasn't until I ran into my own personal problems and couldn't move forward that I, especially around a panic disorder, uh, that I developed, that I had to push the reset button personally, because I just couldn't move forward and may even lose my career, couldn't even give a talk to five undergraduates. Um, but also, that raised the issue, why do, why do humans suffer so much? And that's always been the issue. And the feeling as though, you know, direct contingency principles are just not enough. They're just not enough. And we we can't just be sloppy about it and, and progress. I mean, there's lots of helpful things in the culture literature and music and art yeah but do they progress mm, probably not shakespeare's probably even better than your average or even great writer of today uh, lived long ago uh, never mind beowulf or whatever so you uh personally what i did and this is a long way of answering what act what's different about act in either form, is that I dedicated about 20 years in the wilderness with nobody following me or my students, it's just me and a few students, uh, to try to drill down into the smallest set of processes and principles that do the most good that are needed to be added to evolution science and direct contingency principles and easy sort of easy social learning principles in order to be able to help people in the most flexible way, I mean, in the most areas. And we ended up with what's called ACT, which is now 40 years old. It only became visible about 20 years ago to the mainstream. But we're sitting here now with a thousand randomized trials and another couple hundred about to load up to the list. So I'm so be saying 1,200 randomized trials and with more data on how change happens than any other approach in psychology, and it's distributed by WHO and blah, 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 blah. We can talk about that, and that's great, and that's grand. But really, what is ACT? ACT is my name for the smallest set of principles that do the most things, that have the best basic foundation uh, that we call psychological flexibility, and... Uh, there's the, uh, the technology of putting that in people's lives uh, can be very wide. We've got a lot of cool things that are called classic act, but I don't think of act as a technology. It's a focus. It's a focus on psychological flexibility. And now with some changes that we'll get into, extending that into relationships and into your body, learning those skills that will move you forward and power your life as a um, 
as an evolving whole, mm -hmm. how to evolve a life that works. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't really care about the name. People don't want to say, well, that, I do that and that's not act great. Show that you're moving those processes, do the research to make sure if there's more that's needed, let's add them sure. and hold yourself to account for that. You want to call it act great. You want to call it uncle Fred, the wonder slug. I'm good with that too. Uh, I don't care about that. What I care about is empowering people. And that's kind of different than a lot of psychotherapies out of there that have a technique and have a package and have heroes and gurus and, and trainings. And it's all good. It's all fine. But is it really progressive over uh, decades? Uh, you know, ACT is not the same ACT as it was just a few decades ago. And so I'm proud of uh, building a tradition that can offer people the smallest set of things to learn that do the most good in the most areas. And to me, that, I'm, that ACT is my name for that journey. Yeah, sure. That, yeah, that's really great. Um... Uh, answer and it, it raises a question for me um you talk about the name um and you know it doesn't matter what we call it though acceptance and commitment for i suppose those who are familiar with act or at least the, the fundamentals of it um speak to the i guess the principles of it or this sort of the, the hexaflex you know in the yeah. sense of, and is that's at least my understanding of what sort of distinguishes act say from your cbts and stuff is in is its response to uh distress um it, it's not so much about modifying um you know say thoughts and uh, uh, perhaps thoughts and this commitment to uh, a meaningful life a purposeful life yeah. um so and so i suppose yeah. my question is is that a could you describe could act be described broadly and i know it you, you're saying that sure. it's, I, yeah. I, th I think you can you know it's learning to be more open in the area of affect cognition memory sensation to be more aware of what's going on inside and out from a part of you that is connects you in consciousness to others and then taking those skills it's all together people often call mindfulness but you don't have to call it that you can just call it situational awareness or uh, you know, flexibility in the moment or taking that l level of openness and awareness into what do you really want your life to be about? I don't mean just your goals, but what do you want to manifest in the actions that you uh, reveal and how to build habits around that? And nowadays, I'd say, and extend that to your relationships and your body. That's it. And uh, you know, as we enter into that, you say, well, how's that different from CBT? CBT always worked by these principles, but didn't necessarily know these principles because there hadn't been a 20 year detour into building a basic science that could be adequate for CBT. That's not what happened. Behavior therapy clearly had limits. It wasn't dealing well with cognition. Joe Volpe, et cetera. Simple associationistic principles drawn from non-human animals weren't enough. And Tim Beck or Mike Mahoney, or you pick the folks in the early, early uh, era, all of whom were friends and I respect for their work and they're not enemies, but they did the logical, reasonable thing. Like you start looking at what, when people suffer, well, for example, they often have odd thoughts and they get wrapped around the thoughts. Okay, well, let's just target the thoughts. Well, what would you logically do if you hadn't a big theory? You'd tell people what to think. Don't think that, think this. Well, that turns out that's dangerous. It's not how change happens, even when it does happen that way. And really, I'm creating a little bit of a cartoon because somebody like Tim Beck, Aaron Beck, the father of cognitive therapy, you could see it in his clinical work that he knew this full well on, but the people who are listening to his theory then got in there and detecting, challenging, disputing, and changing your thoughts was the whole focus. Yeah, but you're only two millimeters away from out with the bad and in with the good. As soon as you go out with the bad, how do you know that it's out? You have to you have to watch it. You have to look at it. You have to make sure it went out. Every time you watch and look, it went in. It went into your consciousness at least. And you're really, really close to a cycle of suppression because you can pull, push things down. 
But when you do that and make them more important, they happily pop back up. But it's a little later after you learned the wrong lesson. And so uh, because of the journey of let's dig down and really drill into philosophy of science issues and basic principles and even creating a whole vigorous psychology of what symbolic learning is. That right now, today, if you have a kid who can't speak, run, don't walk to a behavior analyst who understands relational frame theory because that child's life might be saved if you do it fast enough and well enough. And if you don't, you may have a lifelong process of a person who's disabled. So it wasn't just airy fairy. Here's my theory. I, you know, I have a theory of cognition. No, we had, I wonder the kind of principles that led to procedures that would be shown in experimental analysis to work at that level, way below what people listening to this would want. I mean, most people listening to this one was give me some guidance as to how to be happier. <laughs> yeah. But it turns out, why are, why is it so hard to be happy? In part because we're the poor creatures who invented this wonderful, fantastic, awesome amazing ability to relate anything to anything else in any possible way yes which which comes to um this notion of relational frame theory yeah. um, which i suppose I, which i suppose in a way you have kind of just there described broadly what it is it's this um uh, yeah. i don't know whether i ask you to if you'd feel like it would be better perhaps you could clarify relational frame theory a bit further yeah I think I could, and I could explain why it matters in terms of application. Yeah, yeah, please do. If mainstream CBT and the tools I applied when I got really in trouble with panic, developing panic disorder and spent three years, you know, going down the drain of, of how panic disorder works when you're doing the logical, reasonable, sensible, pathological things that your mind tells you to do with it, which is to run, fight, and hide, um, you know, those common sense, that's harsh, but the logical places to go with cognition that are dangerous, that are not informed directly by basic research, but are kind of an obvious implication of the fact that people who suffer often think odd things and get wrapped around them. Um, turns out, comes from a, a theory of how cognition works that's not real. It's not how cognition works or what it is. What we're doing right now that is fantastic, what we invented, is the ability initially to cooperate within a tribe or a troop by being able to have a two-way street between objects and names without having to be taught the two-way street to learn in one way. You learn it name object or object name, you can drive a two-way street between them. Starts happening around 12 to 14 months. You say to your six-month-old, you know, mama, you know, it only goes in the direction you train it, just like with language trained chimps or your dogs. You can train it, but it's in one direction. You want two directions, you have to train it in two directions. Mama, hear the word, the sound, find mama. See mama, say, or expect to hear mama. Two direct, two ways, train separately. Yeah, but by the time they're 16 months old, I can say cup and raise my cup. And just minutes later, say cup, and the little baby's you know wobbly head will try to find the cup. And if your child doesn't do that, your child's not going to develop normal human language and thinking. It's just not going to happen. You better worry about that. Well, it turns out that probably came as an extension of cooperation or the most cooperative species of all the primates by far, 100 times more cooperative than chimpanzees for whom we share 90 plus odd percent of our genome, you know, they're not that different to them. But that break of learn it in one and derive it in two, soon enough extended, probably started just within the troop, you know, hearing apple, you bring the apple. So the two-way street was the group eventually became internalized and it's just in your mind. And pretty soon... It isn't just this is that, it's this is not that, this is better than that, this is before that, I should have that, 
I mean me, you're you, here, there, now, then, left, right, up, down, better, pet, and you see that explosion of your babies, if you've ever had a kid, where things you didn't teach them, they know, yeah, but they're listening, mm. and they're looking, and they hear an unfamiliar name, they find the unfamiliar object, they assume it's related, they put them together in a two-way street, they know from tone of voice, you know, that the difference between is and is not, or opposite, or better, et cetera, and through words. Well, as that begins to happen, here's what we end up with. We're historical beings. There's no delete button in your nervous system that's healthy. Anything that goes in, goes into this network of cognitive relations. Anything you see, think, or remember, if you've touched it with symbolic language, you can have things that are fully intuitive. Absolutely. Hit a baseball. You can do it. And you better know how to do that or you're not going to be able to hit a baseball. You know, you don't want to be thinking about the parabolic function of a of a ball in flight. <laughs> the ball's going right by it. But, or, nor dance or play music or anything. There's lots of things where we we'll walk or we really need to move symbolic learning off to the side and let learning processes that go all the way back to the Cambrian, which is 545 million years ago, take hold. In other words, things that are a thousand times older than what you and I are doing. Well, so just for a normal folks listening, you have the capacity to relate anything to anything else in any possible way. Look at your, your desk, find two objects and say, how did this one become, how is this one the father of that one? Hmm. You don't think about what's the father of something else very often. You heard an old bald guy say it on a podcast, do it. And let's say life depends on a good answer, an apt answer, one that really fits the properties of this one and that one. I looked at my glasses and I looked at my pen. By wearing the glasses, I was able to see what I was writing on the paper as to how to produce pens. My glasses are the father of the pen. Yeah, but probably I wrote it down with a pen to design the glasses. <gasps> my pen was the father of glass. No, dude. You are imposing on the world a cognitive structure. Yes. Back to why it matters clinically. If there's no delete button and anything can relate to anything in any possible way, cognitively, just challenge yourself and you can do it. How are you going to possibly weed through the ginormous spider web that that produces and say, I only want positive thoughts and rational thoughts and nice thoughts and... Have you ever tried to rearrange a spider web? As a kid, I would try to do it because I, I lived where there were black widows and they produced this mash. And as long as it wasn't there, I'd say, can I just, no, you can't. It just turns into a big ball of stuff in your hand. So for those listening, you want to clean up your cognitive ecology, you better learn how to take what's useful and respectfully leave the rest, not delete the rest, but just leave it, let it sign this, lying there, not controlling your behavior beyond what's necessary. Mm. When you do that, it becomes less important. You actually do get the benefits of what we might call cognitive reappraisal. I can think this and not think that. Not by out with that thought, out with that thought. The traditional CBT is too dangerous. Sure. So I love CBT, but I want to do a modern form of CBT yes. that is formed by a basic science of cognition that's real. And I think viewing cognition as relationally learning uh, mm -hmm. that evolved initially for cooperation has been harnessed for problem solving allows you to take what's useful and leave the rest. Uh, yeah, and so... It's essentially uh, relational frame theory. Then, yeah, as, as you've just explained there, it's 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 the context or the the ground in which cognition emerges, I suppose, through this relational framing. And and I and as as I've read a couple of papers, it's where distress or perhaps or what we call uh, suffering, as opposed to pain, maybe is this when arbitrary we make arbitrary sort of we derive arbitrary relations between stimulus. Yeah, and we, we do it all the time. Yeah, and we reify them, and it's like if I go to the, you know, so I don't know. Uh, you associate your anxiety with the supermarket, and it could be that that and the past has happened, but actually, is the supermarket really causing anxiety in of itself? 
Yeah, exactly. And and association is a kind of relation. We commonly would say you associate. Really, you relate, and you relate it in a particular way, depending on your idiosyncratic history. But there tends to be patterns. There's these kind of central attractors in complex systems. You know, once you have a way of working through complexity, you tend to overplay it over and over again. And so some people default to paranoid thoughts. Some people default to I'm great and I'm grand. Some people talk to I don't know, I didn't, whatever it is. Mm. So their, their characteristic patterns show up. It's wonderful that we have this capacity. We don't need to become Dr. Einstein of our own mind to be able to prosper. We just need to put our mind on a leash and learn from experience, keeping our eyes on the prize. Are we moving forward or backward? If we're moving forward, forward, great, do more of that. If you're moving backward, okay, do less of that. What is the that? How do you handle what you think and feel? What is your attention and who do you even take yourself to be? And what is of importance here? What are the qualities you want to reveal and how have you built habits around that? If you want a three-word way of saying it, how to be more open, aware, and actively engaged in life. If you want a one-word way of saying it, how to be more loving with yourself and others. If you want a single-letter way of saying it, how to be. Hmm. Yes. And I must ask, how much has did or I'm, I'm assuming and i could be wrong but like buddhism and you know sort of eastern traditions influence and um, yeah inspire the development or did it not and it just happens to relate uh i think it's both an and i mean i'm a child of the 60s i sat on hippie hill in the summer of love sm smoked and consumed uh, things that are now illegal or if the fda approves it is soon to become illegal um but then weren't but also, yeah, of course, you know, I had some exposure to Suzuki and Watts and any hippie dippy person in California would have had exposure to these things. And I had some special exposure, but not extensive. You know, I happened to hear one of the first lectures of Roshu Joshi's, Joshu Sasaki Roshi, who was a huge Zen master in the US of A right soon after he came off the boat from Japan. I happened to be in a lecture at Loyola Marymount University and hear it before he was even able to speak English and so forth, hearing the translation. And I lived for a little while on a Hindu offshoot commune because I was helping a friend uh, build a house and wasn't really a member of the commune. The Hindu offshoot is self-realization fellowship, Paramahansa Yogananda. You can be in two places at once if you meditate enough. Oh, please. And the hippies loved it. I thought it was a little goofy, but dabbled. But, you know, I'm not... You know, beyond just swimming in Western cultural streams that everybody in my generation swam in. Um, you know, I think I tell a story that you know, maybe if I, uh, hey, a couple of things. Deep inside the wing of behaviors in my end that would take a more of a conversation we probably need to have. Um, this connection was always there. I mean, I was reading articles on things like Buddhism and behavior modification. As a student, people who don't know that there's this radically contextualistic wing wouldn't know that. Uh, the way I usually surprise people is say, yeah, and one of the authors of Gestalt Therapy, Ralph Hefferlein, was a card-carrying behavior analyst out of that same wing. So you, when you look at act and say, oh, that looks like Gestalt, well, no shit. It's coming out of the same tradition. Fritz Perls wasn't the only person who created that. And he called it Gestalt because he thought classic Wertheimer was coming back. Gestalt was like, it never came back. Gestalt psychology didn't come back. You know, Ralph wanted to call it integrative therapy because it integrated humanistic concerns with these radically behavioral. I mean, you could see inside just Buddhist and teachings and stuff. You, you do what you do and you get what you get. Does that sound a little Eastern? Yeah, of course, it's radically behavioral, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Of course it is. Well, there's a wing that is not mechanistic. Now, it's that holds on to that. And it turns out it's actually linked to Skinner, who is massively misunderstood. For most people, that's all dark history. And if you've got any training at all, it takes you in exactly the wrong direction because everybody knows behaviors don't think about the mind. No, well... 
And now we're in it. I'll give you a classic quote from Skinner. I'm not saying there is no mind. I'm just saying that concept gets in the way of more important things. Hmm. Why would he say that? Or here's another one. Well, in the real world, or at least the one world, that why would he say that? Because this wing is a radically monistic. If you had to pick one, it would be the non-duality wing. Mm -hmm. have, have you ever contacted the non-duality folks? Mm -hmm. I come out of scientific non-duality. Yes, 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 yes. I'm very much interested in that. And that's why I suppose I ask, it's like, um, you know, like non, I, I mean, I've got the Upanishad somewhere in my room, you know, it's like, that's why I find really interesting. And also I find really interesting because in some of the papers you've written, you talk about how RFU, or at least act, it's not necessarily ontological, or it doesn't explicitly concern itself with that. It's more like a pragmatic, it's, it's more like an epistemology. It's, it's in yeah. written in pragmatism, though I can't help but, it do, one need not necessarily un, uh, see act or the processes of act is uh, consider the sort of ontology of it, but I can't help but do it when, for example, a lot of the hexaflex tries to help a person perhaps come into contact with awareness or that which right. is thoughts, and that that in doing that one is able to decouple some of these relational frames that exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. You know, you could well, but I do have a little. Uh, file george of just like act i call it and it's pretty fat all of the wisdom and spiritual traditions all of them have the deep connections of the psychological flexibility model every single one but mm. why because they all came out of mystical experiences mm. name for me a big religion big important religion that didn't have founders that had mystical experiences you can't do it sure, 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 because sure, that's sure. where it came from well what happens in mystical experiences Let's just take what's going on right now, psychedelic assisted therapy, where you can increase the probability. I mean, most people, if you ask the question right, and we're up into the 90s plus, have had deep spiritual experiences. If you do a theistic way of saying it, it goes way down, but you can say it another way. And, and what's inside those experiences? Experience of oneness across time, place, and person, mm -hmm. almost universally. And like in the psychedelic space, there's measures of it, oceanic awareness and, you know, no. okay, so I'm out of a scientific wing that is really weird, that is naturalistic, but is not reductionistic, nor is it materialistic. It's yes. monistic. In the real world, or at least the one world, why would you say yeah, that? yeah 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 i think i see i i think i see it i think i see it now but it's really weird because skin has been yeah how did he end up being boxed up as somebody who denied i don't know maybe that doesn't matter well you know you start digging in the philosophy of science that's behind that wing of behaviorism and it was in there before things were called behaviorism not watson you know skinner throws over almost everything that watson is known for you know Private events. We're going back. Introspections is fine. Introspections fine. I mean, we almost all those things are thrown over. What what Fred what B. F. Skinner? I actually got call him Fred because I had multiple conversations with him, which I call him Fred. Um, as a young man, uh, should have done is called it radical contextualism or something like that. But behaviorism was so dominant then, and he was out of that wing, but. He, he touches into things that are there inside um, people like Mach or there's this kind of radical uh, evolutionary folks who realize that evolutionary epistemology doesn't afford ontology. It doesn't. If you always, like, what's radical about radical behaviorism? You've heard the phrase radical behaviorism. Radical means to the root. It's that you look at your own behavior the same way. When you do that, public and private collapse. Inside, it's no longer mental, physical, it collapses. Yeah. Because scientific knowing is just an act in context. Yeah. For what? Well, it depends on what you're trying to produce. Well, that's epistemology, but it never gets to ontology because as another, I'm doing Skinner quotes on you, dude. I didn't know if you really expected that. 
but he sneers at that with a you know with the idea from the epicycle of mercury one might view the world he said nobody is sitting in the epicycle of mercury epicycle of mercury is a little phrase to what you know when they were trying to figure out why the planets moved around the sun precisely the way they did and they had these crazy ideas about these little swirling things because you know it had to be uh you know, it couldn't be the earth as the center. It had to be the sun as the center. So you couldn't work out the math. And uh, so some of the clutches, they they and he sneers at it in this way. You know, like if you could somehow step out of yourself without a culture and a history and without any kind of contingencies or learning or that for you, and you look back, then you could see the real, no, dude, you can't do that. Yeah, You're yeah, not yeah. going to see anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever you see, you'll see based on your evolutionary history at all levels, including your learning history. That's part of evolution. Including yeah, yeah. your symbolic and cultural history. That's part of evolution. Yeah. Um, that means it's all epistemology. Yeah. It's all knowing. Yeah, we're the knowing creatures of this weird knowing of learn it one, derive it in two, put it in networks that change what you do. You know, the four line ditty that summarizes 40 years of work in relational frame theory. And that changes everything. That means we don't get a pass. I mean, you look at some people who were really, really important evolutionists. Don Campbell, for example. I don't, I'm not familiar with that name. I mean, oh, he's a brilliant psychologist, dead long since, but one of the first to make the claim that variation and selection was really at the center of things like knowledge development and for and really take and take evolutionary principles pull them away from the gene-centric era, apply them to psychology, culture, et cetera. Yeah, but when he was pushed to apply it to his own knowledge process, he refused to do it. He said, I can go there, but it's very close to solipsism. Because he saw if you did it, you could no longer make ontological claims. And he did not want to let go of that as a naturalist. And so I've meet people and I've, you know, my lovely colleague, David Sloan Wilson, major evolutionist, I run into the same problem with him because when he really comes down to it, he wants real. Yeah, what and it's that criticism you make though about you can't take it to yourself, that's actually being applied. I've heard people, um, uh, criticize um donald hoffman's um ev uh, fitness beast truth theorem it's like well if you take the principles he has a, a counterclaim yeah. that it, it it only applies to sensory um inputs not cognitive yeah uh, this idea that it's almost self-refuting um but and that yeah it's, it's interesting but I, I love it you know i emailed him when that book came out and it was right after a liberated mind came out it was the same week and mm -hmm. we were rising at the same time and i you know even used my uh, my good friend's name. You know, I'm a colleague, Dave Sloan Wilson. I've written some books with him. Why? Because he knows David's work. He's an evolutionist, but he's also sitting there and berserkly with you know, you know, people who come up with uh, how is DNA organized and stuff like that. I mean, so I, I didn't get a reply, and I didn't really expect it, but I did do a reach out because uh, some of what Hoffman's trying to do, in my opinion would be supported by knowing something about relational frame theory, for example, and uh, some of these, because he's he's moving over into the psychological domain of scientists. I mean, he's he's in psych psychology, right? And and uh, there's people, he would find friends and allies, um, not that he needs them. You know, he's a major enough figure. He doesn't, I don't mean at all to be sounding arrogant here. It's just I know there's a connection, and I wish I had the opportunity to to develop it. But um, I have to, have to be much more sophisticated in his work than I am right now. You can have the conversation, to be honest. But uh, I do have his book uh, right over my shoulder, and I love it. And yeah, I know it's been criticized and so forth. But the deep message in it, which is do not trust your common sense interaction with the world as if that allows you to sit on the epicycle of mercury and look at reality 100 mm. percent so and to think of it instead as you as an evolving organism is 100 percent so and this comes back full circle to the to the act things though around 
in a way CBT implicit in this it's almost logical positivism or like this idea yeah. that, that there is there are facts of the world which you need to accord yourself with whereas yeah. it's kind of more like no you're just situated in this context which is predicated upon your genes but also your learning history how are you responding to it you, you know yeah exactly now, now I don't want to let go of facts but I want facts to be in scare quotes with enough regularity that you don't forget that facts are not common sense facts. I mean, what we're doing right now is we're having a conversation. Mm -hmm. Inside the process of having a conversation is the ability to name. To name what? To name things and relations and forces. If you're naming things, relations and forces, and you bring it your common sense understanding to the world, in the history of the world, the first thing that happens is you go from uh, primitive things that don't do a very good job, like animism, you know, what's happening? Well, maybe, uh, why is it raining? The gods are crying. Uh, maybe the gods are pissing on us. Uh, how do I know the difference? Oh. <laughs> so it's completely inadequate in terms of a, a grounding of, of, of uh, science. Or the felt experience of a human being period end of story that's inside uh, mysticism yeah, but then true knowledge is saying less and less about more and more. And, you know, people who've gone down that, like the story about the Greek philosopher Cratylus, whose final uh, lecture, you know, they, they had those hoods apart because they'd turn around and you could throw alms in there. They were just poor people, but smart, walking around telling lectures and their students would pay them. That's how they lived. But here was his last lecture. He wagged his finger. In other words... Even one word is a lie mm. because it partitions the whole. Mm. If you're really, really, really into the experience of the wholeness, just freaking shut up because you don't have anything to say about it. As soon as you have something to say about it, just look at the word ab out. Ab out means near and out. Well, if it's only one, you want to be in, not out. So you don't want to say anything about it. Hmm. Ab out it. You want to be ab in it. Or not even ab, you just want to be in it. And, you know, that lures scientists in. Sometimes they get that. You know, when you start messing around with meditation, some of these great scientists of meditation just stop being scientists and they meditate. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. You can experience the oneness. Yeah. You know, those are not, but now we're getting into something. I'm sorry for the long rant. It's okay. Um... But let me just, let me just take. If I if if language then becomes the focus, the first thing that's relatively adequate, let's get everything a name. You know, God made Adam, named all the animals. Okay, let's name everything. Well, there's all kinds of psychologies based on that. You know, what are the five personality types? I say, well, what's the purpose? I don't know, but I want to know the real one. Okay, uh, but dude, you say there's only five. Uh, how about this and this and this? Yeah, but they come down to five. I know there's different types of tables, but they're all tables. There are different types of chairs, but they're all chairs. Okay, what are you going to do with it? I'm not trying to do anything. I'm going to name it. If I name yeah. it, I understand it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, you know, like, so you end up with things that you, I'm a clinician. I want to do things. I'm also a human being. I want to change my life. I want to do better. Okay. The next one after that, Maybe it's more like a clock. Why? Because language will give you parts, relations, and forces. Getting to where a Donald Hoffman gets, or a B.F. Skinner gets, or I, excuse me for the self-praise, but where the contextual behavioral science and act wing gets, or Gestalt therapy, mm. requires in a different thing of saying, okay, let's appreciate the con context boundness of everything. Yeah. And then for my wing, don't just use that to pull down the pants of people with their, you know, ha, 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 I'm a social constructionist, I'll show you how you have assumptions. Or I'm a Marxist, or I'm a feminist, or I'm a dramaturgist, or I'm a narrative psychologist, all great, it's fine, I understand it. But how about making a difference? How about changing it? That's the wing I want to be in. Which is holistic, holistic, but also willing to play a change. Even though the words I use, I know are never quite right because yeah. we're just talking yeah we're not when we partition the world 
we're violating something that's deeply different than that. Well, it's it's interesting. It, 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 the two things, which it, well, I think this nicely brings us on to uh, process birth therapy. But before that, the two, I like to write creatively and um, right. uh, like stories. And there's a sentence from, it just literally just came to my mind as you said that. It's something I, a sentence from something I wrote, wrote before, which is language obfuscates reality. Right, and I think yeah. which is what you're saying, and also it's a bit uh, just coming back is what actually I don't need to go. I was gonna, and I'm, I'm, the reason I don't want to then mention it is because I don't want it to seem like well, it seems as though I'm somehow then putting myself in the same context as Wittgenstein, which I'm not. But what I'm saying is yeah. he spoke about um, uh, where one cannot speak, one must be silent. But what's really interesting also is the development of him. He, 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 by the yeah. end of his life, it's very much similar to what you're talking about now. Yeah, this yeah, idea yeah. of, you know, language games that, you know, that the, you have well, to you consider see, the whole, the context. You're beginning to see the same thing with Chomsky. I mean, you give enough time with this stuff and it, sometimes things evolve. And absolutely, Latter-day Wittgenstein is totally playing a different language yeah. game. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really interesting. And in a way you can really relate to if you begin to think in this more contextualistic way. Yeah. And I I do worry a little bit about one thing that is only, if if you're gonna do that kind of radical contextualism, one of the things that could be that that violates your basic assumptions or very close, but is necessary, is to say, and I want the kind of knowledge I can use to make a difference. Yeah. If you don't do that, if you say, I just want to appreciate, well, then you're into complexity theory, you're into systems theory, you're interested in everything, everything relates to everything else. Everything is held lightly. It's great. It's grand. And frankly, not very many people want to listen to it forever. And frankly, the society doesn't want to pay for it forever. I mean, create a, create a department full of social constructionists. And I'll come back 20 years later and see if the dean still wants to pay for it. Yeah. Because it's like, ha, 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 I caught you, I caught you, you know, so what? Yeah. So what? What are you trying to do here? Just pull down people's pants? That's your goal? No. Conversely, I think we're seeing an era in which people are getting pretty frustrated with some of the, you know, traditional cognitive science that promised it was going to lead to reading programs and better outcomes in clinical, and it never did. Mm. It led to lots of networks, and it was always really soon. I think we're very close with brain sciences. You're, where, where are we're the big? Close. Sorry, big, we're very close with what? Sorry, to the same kind of thing. What are the big, big, big wins in brain sciences that are oh, that are changing people's lives on the ground? Now, I, I, of course, the brain's important. I'm not saying that, but I would rather do that science in a way that wasn't push, pull, click, click, mechanistic, and for forty years hasn't given us stuff. I mean, I look at the Fed's funding of, let's say, mental health, massively oriented towards the body and the brain. Mm. Are the brand new innovations that you can trust don't have huge side effects and so forth that you can use when you're miserable. Mm. Give me one freaking example. You know, and maybe you can do a couple, but geez, yeah, yeah. if you well, have I an addiction, get a good psychotherapist. Don't be maybe agonists and antagonists. Okay, but if you have odd thoughts, mm. so-called anti-psychotics, that's yeah. marketing. That was they were called major tranquilizers, and that was honest. Yeah. And then the marketers got on and said, "No, no, no, they're anti-psychotics." Oh, bullshit! People still have odd thoughts. They have delusions. They have hallucinations. It's just that they're so tranked out that they don't look as odd in their behavior. And by the way, they'll die about ten years earlier. And by the way, they're their involvement in the world is so minimized which i which i'm suspecting from reading around process-based therapy my sense is please do correct me if i'm wrong is that a lot of this you know the criticism you're uh, talking about here has motivated process-based therapy in that it's or it's one of the one of them is that yeah is that we've sort of failed uh, you know um despite the billions of pounds that you you know i think some of the papers that you've co-authored or authored you know you cite some of the examples where like the lead the heads of like the mental health funding institutions have even come out themselves and said we haven't got anywhere 
Well, yeah. I mean, we've been chasing syndromes to get to diseases because diseases give you a functional process you can target. But 50 years of work, not a single psychiatric disease, not one. The last one was general paresis. And you don't have anybody around you with untreated syphilis unless a miracle happened and nobody happened to go to visit their primary care physician. Mm. You know, but but uh, inside this wandering in the wilderness we've been we've been doing that are driven by these mechanistic, I think, assumptions and reductionistic assumptions, we have learned something about how change happens. Mm. And I, it's only one study, but it's a pretty important one. I spent three years with my colleagues looking at every single mediational study ever done in the history of the world, in any language, on any method, as long as it had a mental health outcome, properly identified how change happens using a statistically appropriate mediational analysis, and had as a comparison, some sort of active psychosocial treatment, whatever it's named, whatever it's called, and a wait list or treatment as usual. Why? Because if you have two active treatments, the differences sometimes don't tell you what's really going on in either one. But yeah, it would spend us three years to look at 55,000 studies. We identified about 300 that uh, were clean and had replicated mediators, meaning at least one person somewhere there's a lot of evidence of p-hacking of, you know, after you did the study, finding something that predicts, yeah. you know, please, you know, that's noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least one time it's been replicated, you know, and then those, those 300 findings tell you that if you can be more flexible emotionally and cognitively and intentionally and can be in the present moment consciously mm -hmm. focused on your values and organizing your habits around that and take care of your body and focus on your relationships in the same way. If you get just a little bit friendly, that accounts for almost every single study. If you get tight and you say, no, no, self-esteem is different than this. and that, Okay, maybe we go down to 75%. But that's still, and by the way, just flat out psychological flexibility, the way ACT folks have talked about it, and even using their measures, including mindfulness, which is built in, that's with just tiny little things that aren't even, that's 55% of everything we know. So even if you go all the way down there, you know, that's not a small figure. Yeah. That the entire world's history of how change happens when people are miserable, we can account for 55% of it with a sentence as short as learn how to be more open, aware, and actively engaged in life. And we can take it up to 70 or 80 clearly without any question and take care of your body and your relationships. And we can take it to almost 100% if we say, and by the way, things like reappraisal are really cognitive flexibility. And by the way, things like being relaxed are really more a matter of learning how to be emotionally flexible. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm not saying it's the end of ages and that we're not going to find new processes. But if you knew, let me say it in the abstract. And sometimes I say this when I give lectures to people in public. Public, I give one recently to a bunch of staff who work for a, a large company. And, you know, I've got people in there, you know, wearing their work clothes and stuff like that. And I said, if you knew I could tell you something that would account for about at least 80% of all the things that are involved in whether or not your life's going to prosper or not psychologically, would you want to learn them? I kind of maybe. I said, if I could get it down to, eight words would you be more interested okay. and and furthermore if i could do it if i could convince you that you already know these eight things it's just that your mind doesn't allow you to see it but you can actually show me that you know it hmm. now their heads are going like that and then i just say show me with your body you at your worst when dealing with an issue you pick in your life that's psychological in some way and has been around a while i don't mean oh i don't have enough money period end of story i'm not talking situational yeah, yeah. show me with your body you at your worst when dealing with that now don't change the issue show me with your body you're at your best we've done that study everybody shows postures that are closed unaware and not ready to be actively engaged at their worst and more open by everybody i mean in the high 90s every single person naive just grab people ask them take a picture have it scored they will show more open aware and active postures at their best 
It means everybody knows it. Mm. Everything I have to teach you, really. But your organ between your ears doesn't. Why? Because it's a problem-solving organ used without restraint. If you learn how to use it in a different way, to observe and describe, for example, mindfulness training, attentional flexibility training, you, that organ can at least not, can be helpful and the places where it's hurtful can be reined in. Yeah. But if I just ask you, what's wrong with you and what are you gonna do about it? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a story from hell about how that produced the point where I couldn't even talk to an undergraduate class. And you probably have friends who could tell that story, how it produced an addiction so bad, you know, that they, their body was being damaged and their kids aren't with them and their, their marriages are trashed. So, or you pick it. Or the suicide notes. Pick that. How about that? 65% of them say, when I'm dead, I won't hurt as much. Well, that may be true, but you're freaking dead. <laughs> Come on. How about while you're alive? Mm. Learning how to take on the burden of your history and have it empower your future. Yes. People don't kill themselves when that's the game. Yeah. And so I'm on a rant, but Most damn it. No tool. Yeah. Process based therapy is important because all of the traditions that are involved in behavior change, all of them, can benefit by knowing how change happens. And we now know a really big chunk, not everything, but a really big chunk. And, you know, what is the point of all those b -b 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 billions of dollars we spent on all those trials if we don't use the knowledge? Let's use it. That's process-based therapy. Yeah. And it's a, and, uh, and, and implicit in that, I suppose, and also from reading, whether in, how much of it is in response to directly, but regardless, it is, in, I suppose, contra contradicts or contravenes, you know, the, um, the, the this notion that we've had for many years, you know, I suppose DSM base of like syndromes and m defining distress by the topology of it, as opposed to actually the processes which mediate it for each person, um, which, as we know, varies and it perhaps explains comorbidity and, you know, the, and, and things like this. Well, when you add for each person, I mean, here we go to get into something, George, would take another session because in this journey of process-based therapy and ACT is a form of process-based therapy. So I'm not, I'm still an ACT guy, mm -hmm. but there's other flavors. You can do process-based therapy in different ways and then let's let it compete, not as this traditional way, one protocol versus another, but how do we actually best move the processes? Along that way, several years in, I take a deep breath in and realize, oh my God, I just happily told you about looking for three years at all the mediators. Yeah, but that's at the group level of analysis. And it turns out statistically, it's impossible to really understand processes of change if you start with an abstracted collective called a group. I don't mean real social groups, human groups. I mean this, you know, random assignment to a collective right. doesn't tell you how change happens. So we have recently, the last three or four years, been heavily into how to create statistics that are adequate to detect how processes of change with, work within the person over time. Then looking at how people are similar or different to others and take whatever knowledge you might see there and remodel the individual. And if it helps you understand the individual even more, keep it, if not, throw it out. So it's upside down st stats. Instead of central tendency is true, variability between people is error. The individual is true. The group is a source of error. And there's really good statistical reasons. I mean, well, let's put it this way. Accepted science and the physical sciences that are mathematically proven for almost 100 years that tells you that what the game we've been playing is wrong and needs to be corrected. And this other game, we had invented a, a word for it. Instead of normative categorical stats, it's idiomic stats, uh, needs to be deployed to really make PBTs do what it should do, to really make processes relevant. We've got to make them individually applicable. That could be the individual couple, the individual family, the individual community, it's just that. But whatever unit you're working on, 
you need to appreciate the complexity and the interrelatedness of these processes for that thing you're focused on. And you need a science that tells you how to do that, measurement systems tell you to do that. And if you blur people into error terms, you're not listening. So it's, I wish in a way we didn't end up there because it means like, oh, this means 95% of our field is statistically inadequate to doing what we wanted it to do. And uh, unfortunately, it's true. And so there's a few wings of psychology that knew it all along, kind of, sort of. Behavior analysis is one. Some wings of neuropsych, some wings of development, developmental psych. But boy, has that message been buried in the avalanche of normative categorical stats from Galton forward for a dirty reason. But it would take a, a bit of a conversation to unpack the dirty reason. I mean, from a, a shameful reason. There's a reason why we're in this situation as a world culture. Is I'll say the words, racism. And if you want to pursue that, I'll explain why. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean... Racism and classism. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you want, yeah, talk about it. If you feel like... Uh, I'll, I'll do a short version, George, but look. Okay. Carl Pearson, Pearson's R, right? R. A. Fisher, Fisher's Z. You know any stats? You know these names? I mean, uh, freaking Richard Dawkins said R. A. Fisher is the second most brilliant biologist to ever live, short only to Darwin. Dawkins, right? Fisher was not a biologist; he was a psychologist. Well, well, and you'll see how it's related in a second. Frank Yates. Yates correction of chi square, inventor of the standard deviation, Galton. Yeah, Galton. Yeah, the cousin. Who are, these, what, who are these? What kind of field were these people in? What were they professors of? Oh yes, what did, they, what did they advocate? What What were they working on? What was their task? Eugenics, right? Eugenics. Yes, exactly. The reason why the stats were developed was to categorize people who were worthy or unworthy of having children. From Galton's hereditary genius, you know, which starts advocating for policies that, yeah, it doesn't include murder yet. Mm. But in the US of A, where we happily took these innovations and, but, you know, even when you're getting to murder, we, I mean, the German laws were modeled up after Virginia laws that were among every state in the United States of America you could involuntarily sterilize people for uh, IQ reasons, for uh, mental health reasons, involuntarily. Mm. Talk to Native Americans about what happened to them. And how many of their, you know, it's just, it's just shocking. And you think, oh, well, that's a deep history. That's long ago. Ari Fisher was writing letters to the London Times about how not to let the Jews escape Germany because it would pollute the gene pool. Don't be telling me that. Yeah, that's that's probably... my great aunts and uncles that died in ovens because of freaking R.A. Fisher, the second greatest biologist in the world. No. Fucking no. Sorry, you're not going to be able to... Have to, have to <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but it wasn't that they were trying to do evil two-thirds of the presidents of the APA were eugenicists from 1892 to 1947. It was considered progressive. They were trying to evolve the human species. Yeah, but they allowed all the racism and classism because of how they did the stats mm. to enter in. I mean, my mentor's mentor's mentor was the first person to develop an infant intelligence test. Why? To to find out who had the RG to be worthy of the education and the other folks should be trained to be gardeners or maids. Mm. And by the way, they're mostly black and brown. I mean, this we're living inside a culture that has been contaminated for 150 years by a scientific culture and a world culture as a result. Just listen to the kitchen table, you know. Yeah, little Stevie is in the gifted and talented class. Ah, based on what? An IQ test. 
you want to walk through how contaminated that is and what that does to cultural minorities? Let's do it. You know, raw G. You want to see the studies, what happens when you take, back to relational frame theory, you take people who don't have that gift and you train them to fluency and relational learning and see what happens to their IQ. You want to talk about that? Can you raise fluid IQ? So-called fluid. It's the mm. fixed part, actually, though, whatever they call it, fluid. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. we've sold people short, you know, whether it's inside the, you know, you're, a, you're schizophrenic or, you know, you're dumb or, and we've done it using tools that every stat class teaches. Mm. And, and that would be okay if used properly, but what are the tools that are not being taught? How to measure, analyze, detect empowerment processes that apply within the person over time. And that requires a very different change in thinking. And when I talk to statisticians, I tell people all I see is nostrils because when they listen to me, my all I, their, their nose goes straight up in the air and all I can see is their nostrils. But then I show them the data. What happens when you do multi-level modeling the way you're doing it and try to model the individual? You massively distort the individuals, massively. And you don't even know you do it. And then you tell everybody you know how the individuals work. So this so dirty history is as live as your kitchen table. So interesting we talk about. And I mean, you know, yeah, it's... Um... It's it's something we do. You see it now. It's this. I don't know if it's a human tendency, perhaps. You know, it's how rude it is. If it's just a human proclivity which we have to overcome through awareness, I don't know awareness, but this notion of grouping people. You know, we we've done it. You know, for so long, it's this grouping people, and uh, they, so often it's just arbitrary. Well, I, but you know how recent this is, George. Uh, the first person ever to have statistical averages of people and talk about how normal people were, that's Kettle A. And we're talking about the, you know, 1830, 1840. I mean, the word normal wasn't in English till 1848. And it came out of geometry and it wasn't applied in a way that, I mean, you can't talk to anybody usually without usually average normal showing up. I mean, normally that's true. I mean, you just, you just can't even think outside of normal. And we went through a thing where, do you know they used to have competitions as who's the most normal woman? <laughs> what on earth? Saturday, the Saturday Evening Post, which was the, one of the most popular magazines in the US of A, had a national competition, you know, with each city, you know, nominating the most normal woman. That sounds satirical. What? As measured by breast size, waist size. I see, I see. Yeah. I see. And wow. they had a statue because they did the math. I was telling this, the story that Ketele, who was a mathematician, became an astronomer and uh, was the one who came up first with the true score and error. That was his innovation. Because when you're watching where the stars go, you knew the stars couldn't be moving around. So if different observers saw different things, that's error. And the average or other central tendency, that would be the true score. Yeah, that's great. And he worshiped the average and then the whole culture grabbed hold of it and normal became something really cool. I mean, Kettle actually said any de significant deviation from normal is d disorder. I mean, it's, that's almost a word for word quote. If you're not average, you're just, you're, you're damaged. And he, uh, I think it was the first to measure the chest size of all the Scottish soldiers and create an average. The first time anyone measured a whole bunch of folks and created an average. And that's so, the yeah, When you talk about this, it's, 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 it's mad, isn't it? it? It's so deeply rooted, this no, notion of, yeah, average and normal, this notion. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't explain, though, the... I mean, what do you do? Why? Yeah, it's not necessary. Well, it's worse than that. It it distorts and misexplains. We do we've looked at stuff now that we're on to the idiomic issue and you're creating stats adequate to it. We compare our stats with standard stats, even cutting edge, the ones everybody says handles the problem of individuality. 
and we see these massive distortions, but we also see in our approach things that we didn't expect to see. I'll, I'll show you, I'll, I'll pick one. Uh, if you're kind to yourself, you're kind to, kinder to others on average. The correlation is about 0 0.4, 0 0.45. All the studies show it. If you do multi-level modeling, almost every single person shows it over a period of time. Mm -hmm. If you do it one at a time, without any shared variance between people, about one out of 10 people, the nicer they are to themselves, the meaner and nastier they are to others. And nobody listening to this is surprised, nobody. Because if I just said, have you ever met somebody who's into mindfulness and is kind of selfish? Have you ever met somebody who's more interested in their, you know, self-care and bubble bath than, you know, helping out people who they know and love that may need some help from them? And oh, everybody says, yeah, I know people like that. Mm -hmm. Well, how come it's not in our science? We don't see it. It's not there. It's invisible. It's because we're lying to ourselves because we're doing what these racist stat folks created as a deep structure that is now into our assumptive base, like a T.S. Kuhn structure of scientific evolution things or a common sense understanding that's so inside our psychology that we can't even see. You know, this is a Hoffman-esque kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can't even see what's it, in yeah. front of our nose. I mean, well, it, it, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, it wasn't that long ago, you know, I grew, like you said, almost like, grew up you know intellectually so to speak in an undergraduate program and none of this was discussed right it was well, you know, for example if you're in psych did anybody talk about eugenics and psych no 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 did anybody tell you that two-thirds of the presidents of the apa that all their did everybody tell you that this is where these tools no they never never ever did no second world war happened <laughs> You know, the tape went over the mouth, the ears and the eyes, and we just pretended that we had nothing to do with that. No, the psychologists and behavioral health folks, the, the behavioral science folks, wrote the laws, developed the tests, mm -hmm. developed the statistics mm -hmm. that allowed the Holocaust to happen, that allowed that second. You know, you're just seeing the tip of an iceberg there. But now that you cut off the tip, the, the freaking iceberg's still floating around, crashing into things yeah. in a really hostile way where, you know, if yeah, it feels like you're being understood if somebody says you have a chronic brain disease and they're lying to you because there's no evidence that you do. And now your future is short, foreshortened. You're put on a bunch of chemicals that will sh shorten your life. And and then your, your family, this is called compassion. Uh, has pity on you and doesn't expect you to do anything. And oh, poor Uncle George, you know, has chronic depression, has a brain disease. Has, you know, that's not destigmatizing people. That's not compassion. That's pity. Mm -hmm. So one out of five have a disorder, and four out of five are supposed to have pity. Mm -hmm. No, five out of five are dealing with the same processes that took that guy down. And if you work on them yourself and you help your family work on them, the community work on them, that's the vision anyway of PBT. How far can we go in actually reaching into the seriously mentally ill, chronically mentally ill? I don't know, but there's a lot of folks out there on the Voice Hearers Network and stuff like that who will happily remind you that, you know, Nash uh, was hallucinating to the end and won a Nobel Prize. Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. be selling people short. And let's find out how far I don't, I'm not Pollyanna ish. I'm not saying everything is possible. I'm saying let's find out what's possible by taking the blinders off and focusing on the change processes that we know uplift people and try to evolve human life one at a time, but also as a group, but also as a species, not in this crazy, ugly way of eugenics, but in this positive way of. What can we do to modify the processes that uplift people? Yeah, it's almost like trying to create space for people to change, which yeah. actually really is the hallmark of the extend the EEM um, 
you know, because it takes these principles of like from evolutionary theory, you know, of like variation, selection, adaptation and that. Whereas the what we've been doing is the opposite of that, really, in many ways, you know, in terms of we've been defining people, defining people's distress. Oh, you have EUPD, you have such and such. And in that you're 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 restricting your you're you're narrowing somebody you know so these yeah and sadly some of that has gone under the label of evolutionary psychology i mean how about the applied evolutionary psychology this is why as a clinical psychologist but also a basic researcher i think it's so cool to keep your eye on how to make a difference and let that be the one that filters if you take a radically contextualistic view and you're more interested in evolutionary epistemology, you know, how to just be able to notice the way of knowing that is emerging, but then put it to use. Well, that's a really good filter because we can post hoc explain things. And sometimes you end up, instead of by appreciating the evolutionary history, have it be an empowerment process, it becomes a categorization process and it's the exact opposite of empowerment. You know, I mean, the horror story on that is like trying to give the uh, the paleo uh, explanation of rape or something. Mm. Really? And some people have done that. They're great detriment to their careers because, you know, in their Me Too people woke up and said, what the F are you talking about? But, you know, I understand it. And I don't want to just sneer at the folks who fell into that trap, but it is a trap. We need the kind of evolutionary principles that tell us how to best evolve human culture or human and human beings. And that's not La La Land. This is not. And then we floated off the earth as these transcendental beings or something. That's sci-fi. That's fine. But And who knows where our evolutionary history will go or the millennia, but uh, it, probably not there. And uh, meanwhile, how about suffering? Meanwhile, how about disease? I mean, evolutionary medicine, you can't get the simplest ideas in evolutionary medicine into common practice. Don't be taking the freaking at antibiotics until all the germs are killed. I don't care if they want a Nobel and the guy in his, in his speech said you had to. Why? Because then you get the meanest, baddest bugs on the block as the only ones that, that make it through that level of selection. And guess what? we may not be able to evolve the new medicines fast enough to save your life when they bite you. There's a safer way to do it. And evolutionary medicine will tell you how it's almost 180 degrees from what your physician will tell you, mm. but it's not like it hasn't been tested. I mean, uh, well, we'll create a pure environment, but it, yeah. And then we'll have allergies. All of the autoimmune disease will explode. no, Put dirt in your kid's lunch. You know, get him a dog and make sure he sleeps with him. You know, do something. Get out in nature. You know, I mean, people literally having parasites put in, put into their bodies by evolutionary medicine folks with really good outcomes, because you got to give the immune system something to do. My point being, bad knowledge does bad things, even if the 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 elements of the knowledge are true but the overall application and the great filter that we need is application yes so i want the the change agents mm -hmm. and the common sense world out there who wants to know how can you help me and can you do you know both that it will help me and why it works right i want those two answers and i say yes because if i don't know why it's too dangerous and if i don't know that it's helpful it's uh, really close to, uh, you know, being sold, uh, uh, you know, bullshit and, and, and your money be taken away. Mm. I stumbled at an elder moment. What do you call that? When they're, uh, you know, the, the folks used to travel around and, and sell uh, medications that were nonsense or. Snake oil. Yeah, snake oil. Thank you. Uh, I don't, enough of snake oil we want science-based naturalistic and there is a way i think to be monistic naturalistic but not necessarily just mechanistic and appreciate this evolutionary complexity in a new way mm. Great ways of measuring and modeling that dynamical systems that are one at a time and use that to empower people's life journeys that's 
and that's um these principles which um the extended evolutionary meta model is that is that it, the meta model that's exactly what it is yeah the meta model which basically... you know, the meta model is kind of an open thing you can add other processes but it's basically saying okay let's look at your psychological processes but also the social ones and the biological ones and in each case look at variation selection and retention mm -hmm. and then in each case examine and now we just had a new revision that helps you see this look at the context in which that applies <clears throat> Because there's nothing, nothing, no process that's always positive. And there's probably none that are always negative, but there's certainly none that are always positive. So one of the things that's happening in my own work, so I'm spending a lot of time goring my own ox, you know, because I figured if, if we're going to go back and say, oh, by the way, values, you know, your process isn't always helpful when I did it one at a time, which turns out is always true. Uh, let's start with the psychological flexibility processes. And it turns out they're all, Every single one of them, you have to say, this is helpful. Maybe it depends. <laughs> There's none that is just, this is helpful. Mindfulness, you know, it's about one out of 15 folks who are more miserable, the more mindful they are. Mm. See, that's Value, a... about one out of 10 that are more miserable, the more focused on the values they are. And I can put it into a complex system. You can explain it. You right. can see why. Yeah, like the network that you speak about. Contextualized. I, I, the first time I saw this, and I remember the moment I read the study, and I believe it was well done. I believed it. I went like, "Oh my goodness!" Showed that first responders who were ex not experientially avoidant were headed towards mental health problems. Wow! You had to learn to be avoidant on the job. Think about it and see why you got people saying, help me, help me. And, and you're thinking, I can't save that person. You're triaging, right? Into the three groups. This person doesn't need an intervention and will survive. This person doesn't need an intervention and will die. This person needs an event intervention and it may help them survive. That's the group I want to focus of, of the three triage, right? Yeah, but think about the human beings who do that and then have to go home the ambulance drivers and the first responders. Yeah? yeah. 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 Well, if you don't teach them in flexibility skills, like now is not the time to cry and to feel the emotions of looking at somebody in that situation or seeing brains on the street or whatever. Now is the time to save lives, mm. right? Soldiers, policemen, there's lots of folks we ask to do incredibly hard things and they do need some skills of not now, thank you. But when it's done, they also need the skills of, okay, what do I do with my feelings? What do I do with that sense of horror when I saw that? What do I do with these potentially trauma-inducing events? Mm -hmm. And if you teach people properly, they don't have to turn into alcoholics or spousal abusers. Right. And so the point is, is to um, these processes, which traditionally perhaps have been um, um, sort of nomothetically kind of like applied or sort of you know we've almost assumed at least even i've done it um and maybe i don't know if you did prior to understanding or seeing these results or paper your studies but at least i know i had did like i sort of just assumed you know say on the hexaflex these principles that they will always you know you you could apply them to everybody in in all contexts and that sort of naivety which i'm starting to see now but then i suppose in a way with the, those findings act not a act not a, a, without the appreciation of those findings and well, perhaps modeling it or applying it in a sort of a, a larger framework where you 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 draw nodes together and you think about like you know actually how's that impacting the rest of you you know actually perhaps it's being psychologically um perhaps being too much mindfulness perhaps for you actually you know increases your distress or or affects your um makes you you know more uh experience you're avoiding somehow i don't know but i well, suppose what was, what you, know, you, you take people with potentially trauma inducing experiences and then pay no attention to the special features that may rise and go in with hard mindfulness training and you're going to regularly in general you'll help people and you'll regularly hurt people mm. hurt people 
Well, there is such a thing as atrogenesis. We, we, we have to be responsible for that. And if we could avoid it by being more knowledgeable about where the person is in their evolutionary trajectory, sure. given their history and circumstances, mm. you know, we can solve that problem and minimize it. No, not to zero. You're occasionally going to hurt somebody. As a, if you're an intervener, you occasionally hurt some of your clients. You're just going to, I mean, physicians kill people in their careers if they're in surgery or something. Yeah. It's just going to happen. And can we minimize that? Can we really make that small? Yes, we can do that. And so PBT is just the, the methodological philosophy of this tradition that I'm part of that is contextualistic, naturalistic, monistic, and empirical mm -hmm. that is really interested in change, not just prediction, not just telling a story, not just having coherence, but also being able to speak in ways, measure and see in ways that allow you to perturbate a system to mm -hmm. actually, I mean, the tradition I'm out of was called the experimental analysis of behavior. It stopped being used that term before, but the reason it was in there for somebody who's a radical monist, and mm -hmm. I've given you some reasons to believe that Skinner is, is that, well, okay, well then how do I know? Well, if I can change something and it changes in a coherent way and my words help me get to that place, that's a win. Doesn't mean it'll apply to all the tips of the evolutionary branches. That criticism is nonsense. I mean, freaking Skinner's first articles were on tropisms in ants. I mean, don't be telling me it was naive about evolutionary pro. No, it's let's see if we can find ones that go across tips of evolutionary branches. Why? Because then we can do things experimentally that I could never do with a human baby that might guide me a little bit in all to have tools for unpacking human complexity and it worked marvelously well until it didn't work anymore yeah. and it didn't work anymore when you got to this crazy thing we're doing of learn it in one drive it in two where anything can relate to anything in any possible way okay i think we're over that hump now it's time to take the methodology of that which is individually focused high density longitudinal data generalize but with care and if you see regular patterns of generalization from one organism to the next hang on to those if they help you see the, in, the individual organism even better so it's about not a brand new idea it's an old idea well pbt is taking that philosophy of science and meta methodology mm -hmm. and now applying it to the practical world post rft evolutionarily sensible, complex systems to how can I help this exact person? And when you get there to my ACT friends, I'd say you can absolutely still be an ACT person. We do know that those hexagon processes should be learned. Everybody should have that in the repertoire. You need those skills somewhere. Shouldn't be used as something to bludgeon people with or force them into you know, act man, hmm, I'm sick, looks flexible. No, you're not. You're evolving, and there are times even to violate even that rule. That's right in the model, isn't it? The overextension of rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right in the model. So don't extend those rules either. But let's not just leave it with, and therefore you need the clinical intuition and experience as to how to fit it to the individual. No, can we get science to help? Because Never in the history of the world has intuitive wisdom been able to trump data. Whenever you have a good algorithm competing with, oh, it's just my felt sense, whether it's deciding where to cut as a surgeon or what disease do you have or anything, good numbers will beat uh, intuition. So I'm down with experience. That's great. Now let's try to model that and measure that and create the stats that help you transfer that to people who didn't have the experience. And by the way, that includes your clients. They have a right to say, I want this. And the data suggests, if you do that, you'll get better outcomes. So even if you have a spidey sense as a result of 40 years of work in the field, and you know when people are being avoided, and you don't be so trusting. <laughs> And don't be so arrogant to think that you shouldn't be in a conversation that says to people, well, where should we focus? Hmm. Should we 
you know, my sense is here, and actually this data stream says, by the way, this is a place where you blow up, where you start getting avoidant and withdraw. Look what happens. It leads to this, it leads to this, and it goes right back to this. Well, yeah. that's an evolutionary process. You're climbing a hill that doesn't have on it what you wanted, but you're going to have to walk down that hill and walk up this other hill, which means you're going to have to widen down some of these coping strategies of yours. You know, that that having a bottle of wine every night is just not going to take you where you want it to go. I'm not judging you, dude, just look. And you have a right to choose. I don't have the right to say, you got to stop drinking. No, you can drink and look at it. Here's what it does. Great. It has some benefits. And it also has some. So the reason why PBT is the natural and now necessary extension of the ACT journey is that this is part of a larger science journey yes. of how to create the smallest set of processes to do the most things that are based on good evidence that can be applied to individuals. And those and processes, are they going to exclude, like, for example, I mean, people, like they say, you know, because it's a meta model, and so therefore people can bring their own, perhaps. Yes. Model. Is it going to exclude, or, you know, for example, let's say psychoanalysis? No, and in fact, you know, I'm in active conversations with people. I'll give an example of Peter Fonagy and mentalization. Sure. Yeah, I was going to ask you. You can plug it in there, boom. You know, he, he just emailed me a few days ago about a student of his who wants to put ACT into some of the work that they're doing and some of the PBT stuff. And I said, yeah, send him to me. Let's do it. And I said, by the way, why don't we have some additional conversations? I've talk, been able to talk to him just a few times, but I respect his work. I think it's awesome. And I think evidence-based psychotherapists should know Peter Fani's work. Yes, 100%. Okay, but then let's find a way for it to be able to play on this agora of ideas and methods that can be over time put into people's lives in a way that is not done by name brand or heroes or traditions or, you know, the secret ritual, the tattoo you wear. Yeah, 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 like mentalization. It's, um, but that was because I was going to ask, you know, I've seen like um, in the, literature it talks about you know avoidance um self-compassion you've spoken about as a process which you can and then i was going to ask yeah what about mental could that be one well, mentalization but it sounds like yeah for sure it could be i mean you know well mentalization is this kind of perspective taking that allows you to connect in consciousness with the possible emotions of others which if you can't do we already know is one of the key elements whether you call it mentalization or not that will prohibit you from having true compassion and empathy towards others and it will make it very hard for you to enjoy being with others and it's going to facilitate if you don't get that skill in objectifying dehumanizing others so your relationships your happiness your enjoyment of being with others is at stake here not just your narrowly defined mental health right and I think the methods that are involved that have evolved inside that wing of dynamic thinking are wonderful. They're evidence-based, they're process-focused. I mean, don't be telling me it's, you know, it because it's not invented here that we should not be attending to it. The way I explain that, it would be like, if I was building houses for people and somebody says i've got this great house i want to build it say, great 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 i'll do it except i only use stanley tools and unfortunately that there's no power tools that will do what you want but i i have a clutch that i could do it'll cost twice as much and take twice as long but it'll be a stanley house only stanley tools you know everybody's going to walk away but you go to your therapist and you get stanley houses why because people are not taking, well, I don't want to be critical, because we haven't had a conversation about not just how to be eclectic, I don't want to be a loose eclectic, but how to think about these processes and change in a way that we're able to take the best that's out there empirically and use them in the service of the job that this person needs done. If you're going to build, let's say, a timber framing house, cool, and here are the tools we need. If you're going to build a, you know, a, a straw bale house because of you have some cool, here are the tools we're going to need. Somebody who comes forward and 
wants you to build a pathway that's going to be different than a house, etc. So can we be a little more servants of the people we work for instead of thinking that we can lord over them with our opinions and tell them how it's going to be and how you're going to get it? You know, uh, that's not our job. Our, our job is, yeah, be scientific and bring the best into the knowledge, but also listen. And I, I think we could do a lot just by allowing people to tell us not just what the goals are, but even how they would prefer to get there. And we'll, we can give them a range of things that are evidence-based and, and learn how to be flexible enough in our practice that we don't have to. To me, if you want to call that whole journey act, call it act. If you, if you don't, that's great too. Because I view it as a functional definition, not as a topographical definition. And let the technology grow to fit the aspiration. Mm. I'm mindful of time. Um, yeah. yeah, we've had a good fun run, haven't you, my friend? It's just because I've got, I've, I've got, there's a couple of, there's definitely a couple of questions I just wanted to ask because I sort of felt somewhat, um, um, not obliged. Basically, the, the two, yeah. two people who I was um, introduced, um, who introduced me to ACT. Um, so I'm just, um trying to find it um fine i can bring it up here but yeah so <coughs> the other question well, whilst i bring this up the other question i wanted to ask is um my mouth started excuse me, excuse me i got i got a, a little bit of water went down the wrong way and you might have oh, to sorry like, oh sorry yeah you go for it um, <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be coughing in the middle of the no, no, Take your time. Um, okay, got it. Where? Yeah. Fortunately, right when it's you were stumbling, you have to take it out in post production anyway. So, uh... yeah. The um, the question I had was more of like, I suppose, in your own, just as a pr practitioner generally, what's your yeah. feelings or a perspective on self disclosure in, in working with people? You know, and it's a wonderful question. And there is some research out there to guide us. I think we need some idiomic research that really, but the common clinical guidance that, that I give for self-disclosure is you want to use it where that kind of personal connection, and also if you do it right, that kind of reducing of hierarchy. Mm is empowering of the person's journey with you for them. And if it's about your comfort and um, maybe even just your betterment, uh, well, that's probably not what the person's paying you for. Mm -hmm. That's probably not what needs to happen there. Not that it would be harmful, but it could be. And you all know the horror stories that people sometimes get into therapy and yeah. end up almost doing therapy with the therapists because therapists are talking about their own problems. And that's just not fair. It's not right. It's not where you it's not where your expertise should be applied. Sure. Um I, I really like using self-disclosure when there's something a little bit self-deprecatory in the self-disclosure. Right. You know, right. like if it's something you feel a little pride pride about, eh, think again about whether or not that's really what you're, the story you want to tell. Yeah. If it's something where it's so humanizing that you feel a little... You, you sense that you're coming into a closer, more horizontal relationship with your client that is nevertheless empowering of your role. Mm -hmm. Not abandoning your role, like not trying to become a friend instead of a therapist mm -hmm. or whatever. And that might be another metric, is that sixth sense that if this is prideful or just about you, oh, pull the plug on it, if it's 
uh, humbling and amplifying and connecting. Mm. Yeah, try it in small doses and see how this goes and use your experience with this particular person, not just with everybody because people are different. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some cultures in, in the world where self-disclosure is, is a train wreck. You know, that's really, really not what people expect of therapists. Sure. And so you want to do it lightly. From what I understand and what I've seen, Japan might be an example. And I, excuse me if my Japanese colleagues think I'm right wrong on that, but when I've been around Japanese therapists, they're cautious in, in small steps about self-disclosure right. because of the role that the Japanese people expect of a therapist initially. Yeah. So, you know. But it's you... interesting because your answer, again, is one which is defined by flexibility and context, <laughs> you know, and so... I, I think, yeah, which makes a lot of sense. Well, and if we can do that in a way that's really respectful also to the individual, because I just use the class concept, Japanese, you know, mm -hmm. come on. I mean, I've got an African-American daughter. If you just go African-American, you know, you won't understand her history and so forth. Yes, you need to account for that. But it, yeah. uh, that's just another ism. But it doesn't mean that we're not interested in culture and in uh, ethnicity and language and all of that it means we we need to know enough to be able to ask the questions to be able to listen to be able to fit hmm. uh, to whom to this person with this goal given what they want from you to this moment this situation and that's not a one-size-fits-all you can't be going you know i've, I've had i've had two latina spouses of the three that i've had in my life and i can't just go well latinos are like this no it's yeah, yeah there's some rough truth in there but man you'd be so wrong so often if you did that yeah of course but you yeah. don't uh, conversely is to expect ah oh, this person is just like uh you know my brother and sister raised in my house no they had a different history. So self-disclosure and everything you do needs to be put in that context. And I, I don't think it has to be overwhelming. And part of what we're trying to do with PBT and some of these new tools, you know, the apps. I haven't even mentioned the apps. I probably should because people, if they really want to, if something I'm saying is moving people, you know, yeah, I get on my email list. But also I've got some tools to that I think would really help you pursue this. And uh uh, if you so what are the apps, yeah, what, was say, what are the what are the apps called? Yeah, uh, yeah the first one is called Psychflex, P S Y C H F L E X. Just put www.psychflex.com. Yeah. And what that does is it allows you to reach into your client's 167 hours where they're not with you in a 168 hour week if you're seeing a client once a week huh? with nudges and bumps that are process oriented from world class people around the world who have are into content development mm -hmm. and we're on a journey growing fast where really big names and stuff are stepping in and helping out and it changes the vision a little bit because you start saying like okay i'm used to just dealing with depression yeah so in the app you start asking in part of the app which i'll explain in a second you start asking questions that go way beyond the syndromal stuff and you might ask things like i'll give you an example do you have ringing in your ears what? You have ringing in yours? Why would you ask that? Oh, well, let me give you a reason. 15% of your clients have ringing in their ears. Really? Oh, and let me give you another reason. One out of five, it is a very distressing and maybe the most distressing thing in their entire life. Do the math. That means in your average practice here, you're talking with three, four, five percent of the people you're seeing. And you have not a clue because you've never asked the question. And if they gave you the answer, yes, I do, and I'm really distressed by it, you'd think, oh, I need to refer the person to an audiologist. No, you don't. Look, the, we have the studies to show that the same processes that wrap you around the axle of sadness, let's say, and a depression spin down or anxiety and a panic spin down is what wraps you around the axle of a tinnitus distress 
I mean, the best thing for tinnitus out there is process-oriented CBT and ACT, unquestionably. Mm -hmm. And the world's expert in the world, a top 25 psychologist, Gerhard Anderson at the Kar uh, Karolinska and uh, Linchaping. Yeah. And myself, because I have tinnitus, and I went down this rabbit hole and for three years until a suicidal thought reminded me to apply my life's work to my own issue, and I solved it in a day. Mm. It just never occurred to me that so in the app, Psychflex, there's a little program. I too have tinnitus. And there'll be a whole bunch of us. I too have pain. I too am lonely. I too am like right. you're a therapist. You can't just be saying, uh go to the drug and alcohol person, uh, go to the chronic pain person, uh, go to the tinnitus. A, if they're not there, B, if they are. They don't know how to do what you know how to do if you're a process-focused clinician that may be best of brand. So that's the app. one app is to empower your relationship by being able to walk with your clients through their life journey in their pocket right. in a way that's you know GDPR and HIPAA compliant and all of that. And then the other plug-in, this is with my hat on as president of the Institute for Better Health, uh, almost 50 year old uh, charitable organization. I don't take any money from them. I give them money. Uh, there's an app called MindGrapher that collects high density longitudinal data. You, none of you listening will be surprised by what it does. And then applies cutting edge idiomic statistics and complex networks to be able to show you as the client and your clinician working with you, what are the processes of change that are most needed now for that goal what are the places where you're disempowering yourself what are the things you need to learn to empower yourself and so MindGrapher is now plugged in it's a separate app but it's plugged into the psychflex app and it's being plugged into another app in in the netherlands called act guide and right. others if we can negotiate it because we're trying to give not give away, you have to pay some money for it in the companies. You yourself just buy the one app called Psychflex or whatever, or App Guide or the other ones that we plug in. So bottom line is, and if you just want to find out about MindGraph or go to ibh.com, Institute for Better Health, ibh.com. Yeah, and I can, I'll put, I'll, um, I'll put those in uh, the description in the links for people. If yeah, we flipped on MindGraph or at Cyber Monday and we, flipped on Psychflex uh, right at the beginning of August and it's growing in terms of people using it and in terms of the elements in it. But the vision here is one of process-based therapy, basically. Uh, a lot of ACT content in there now, go figure, who do I know? But CBT content coming and, uh, you know, the motion-focused therapy and schema-focused and DBT and all that kind of stuff. And what, why do we need apps? We don't need apps, as re, I think, as a replacement for therapy. I don't want AI therapists yes, yes, doing yes. the work. That sounds like the matrix to me. Mm. Um, but I do want AI empowering therapists to be able to work better, faster, cheaper, and in a way that doesn't burn out the therapists, that increases the working alliance, that builds the relationships, as you walk with your clients in the 24 seven world that they're in, instead of just one hour a week world that we get shoved in by the healthcare system. If you're lucky once an hour a week, it could be one hour, two weeks, you know, please. So that's the, uh, the reason I'm focused on those apps though, really, if I can just add a couple sentences, really, really the bottom line, if we want to learn how to model processes of change, change them to help the individual we need hundreds or thousands of examples right yeah, yeah, yeah. The irony if you really want to focus on the individual you have to learn how to do it by many 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 individuals and then see some templates some similarities that will help you see the person even more clearly like polishing your glasses so that i can see the person more clearly because i polished it by the similarities that exist between people that's a different kind of stats but this combo gives me a clinical reason to want to do that because it's making my life easier as a clinician and my doing more effective with my clients and the clients love it 
which they do. They love the little pings. You know, check this out before you go out to that Thanksgiving dinner with your family, knowing that Uncle George is going to be criticizing you once again for being gay or whatever. You know, there's there's ways we can reach into our client's life just in time interventions. But then as they're willing to share what their experiences are with some regularity and we create those data streams, can we put them in a fully de-identified, de protected, absolutely private way that Apple and Google can never get their dirty hands on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've built a science panel. I spent three years doing this world-class science panel around the data. And then as it builds, pro-social scientists around the world can query it. I'm not giving you the data, but we'll give you the ways to query the data so that we can learn how best to uh, help people inside this complex network, this big spider web called a human life. Gosh, it's a big responsibility. That's a, you know, that, yeah. Well, I just retired, so that's my game. I'm figuring. Oh, see, so this is an interesting question. So you said you're saying then you've retired, but it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> well, I start out with this idea that in the end you're dead, and in the end it's a big ice ball. And meanwhile, your job is to play, and to play at this important game of building a life worth living and being useful to others, putting love in the world, if you wanted to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a different way. Well, if you really embrace that, why would you stop playing? I mean, I, I, you do it any way you want. You know, if you want to, it, you could play it just being a really great hubby, you know, sitting by the beach and being a really great dad, you know, playing with your kids, whatever. That's all fine. I'm all cool with that. But I spent 40 years playing at the game of, you know, trying to change behavioral science and psychology. So why would I stop playing that game? It's fun. Not because it's important and people will build important quotes, scare quotes, or people will build castles in the sky in the name of Steve Hayes or something. Not because of all that stuff. Sure. And so what's your, what's your loving? And, you know, across your career, man, what, uh, what's been, you know, the greatest joy or, you know, what if, if maybe there's not one maybe there is you know what has been you know do you think when you look back what's been most rewarding the most rewarding i mean for me personally most rewarding i probably my kids but if you got beyond that uh it'd probably my spouse but if you got beyond that i'd probably say the fact that I and my colleagues, and it's a vast number now, starting from a tiny little group, but in a tradition that's been around for a long, long time. I've told you a lot about the tradition. Mm -hmm. Have been able to do some things that appear to be useful enough that the mainstream culture is attending to them and human beings around are using them. You know, there's several million, probably about five to seven million act books and print around the world. That's cool. It's probably about 100,000 act trained clinicians around the world. That's cool. The World Health Organization, right at this very moment, is deploying an act self-help book and audio tape in uh, Israel and in uh, the South Sudan uh, and in uh, Uganda. And, in, you know, so, and by the way, the single, this is prideful, the, you know, you asked me, I, I am pleased by this. The single most commonly downloaded document in the entire WHO website is that book. And it's an act book. Russ Harris wrote it in part because I told Mark Van Omeren when he called me eight, nine years ago and asked, what can we do about people who are suffering from war, given that they don't just develop anxiety, depression? No, it's everything. Everything that you can name goes to hell in a handbasket. And I said, teach them psychological flexibility skills. And he said, would you do it? I said, no, because I'm not good enough, but I will get you to somebody who's brilliant at it. And I had him referred to Russ because he's such a good popularizer. And he actually wrote the book called Doing What Matters in Times of Stress. And so, you know, when I look at that and I say, okay, well, 
if you can do some love in the world with your spouse and kids, but you could do some love in the world with your profession, that's pretty good. And will it, you know, nowhere in that book is Steve Hayes as a name. In fact, poor Russ is in one tiny line, not even on the cover, in the because that's the way they roll at the BHO, and, and I kind of like it. Nobody will remember our names, and they don't need to. Mm. The people who allowed us through their cooperation and effort to be talking across thousands of miles in real time, we don't know their names. We're standing on their shoulders right now. Look around your room, wherever you are, anybody listening. And man, should you be doing a prayer of thankfulness to the hundreds and thousands of generations of human beings who have allowed this amazing world that you're in right now where you're not starving or you're not listening to this podcast, let's be honest. You know, you're not. You are so privileged compared to the rest of the history of the world. You know, and I'm not saying don't be unhappy and whatever. Okay, but let's learn together how to have modern minds for that modern world. I mean, if we do it right, the freaking robots may be growing our food for us and driving us around in our cars. You know, we're going to have to have something to do. How about putting love in the world? That'd be a great thing. How about creativity, science, art, literature, music, fun? You know, there's a lot of cool things we can we have ahead of us mm -hmm. and we've done so many amazing things you're less likely to die from war you're less likely to be die from violence you're less likely to be a victim of prejudice you name it right now ever than the history of the world if you can't control where you're born you're yeah. less likely to die of starvation why yeah. is everybody running around dancing in the streets saying woohoo because the modern world is feeding some of these pathology processes that are huh, we're drowning in exposure to pain, comparison, and judgment. This and this leads, uh, as I mentioned before, those two questions. Um, one of them, uh, so two chaps, two guys um, who introduced me to act. So one of them is James, and he asked. How can individuals engaging in leadership behaviors draw knowledge of RFT at different positions of leadership, for example, governments down to individual behavior? Yeah. Well, we have some data on that. I mean, you really psychologically flexible leaders who put in their practices, psychological flexibility principles in terms of how they organize the work environment and power the people they're working with to interact with that environment benefit in all the ways that you'd expect, including monetarily, the success of the organization, cooperation, the degree to which people will stick and stay when you've trained them. I mean, all the measures line up properly. Mm -hmm. Now you do get into things at the social level that you don't see it just at the psychological level that where ACT starts. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to work on the principles to help do that. Some of that is extending the ones we have, you know, like emotional openness for you means being more empathetic for others. Cognitive flexibility for you means listening really in a genuine conversation, the opinions of others, values, joint values, attention, joint attention, overt behavior and commitments, shared behavior and commitments, etc. But then there's other things like, for example, Lynn Ostrom's core design principles, great evolutionary scientist and a political scientist who won the Nobel in economics because she showed that the top-down uh, command and control or bottom-up greed and good is both a lie. They both are not really what human beings have evolved to be. We've evolved to be the cooperative species, but you got to create a context in which it's safe to cooperate. And her eight principles, so-called core design principles for which she won the Nobel, explains why people in Nepal can grow their vegetables and the people at the end of the line with the water still have enough water to eat. And the person at the head doesn't have a gigantic garden saying, woohoo, good for me, screw you. No, because yeah. they've evolved the social, cultural practices that make it fair, make it possible to trust and to be part of and to have leaders and give them control in the way you, as the group, it's want to give them control or the democracy or picking the chief or, you know, you can do it a hundred different ways. 
but you're part of it. You're part of the group. And, and so I won't walk through all the core design principles, but we've combined psychological flexibility principles and the core design principles in a program called Pro Social. And if you go to www.prosocial.world, you can learn about what uh, is going on there. Or you can buy a book that David Sloan Wilson, myself, and Paul Atkins wrote uh, called Pro Social. So okay. if you want to be a good leader, work on your own flexibility skills, put them in the environment. For example, allowing people to apply their values and to do some things with their, their work setting, et cetera. If you say, look, we only do this and we follow these rules. Everybody has to do it this way. And if you want permission, you better send up the memo through the chain. It'll only take two months to get a response. <laughs> okay, great, dude. But your group's not pro going to prosper. Mm. I and mean, what is transformational leadership anyway? You just look at the leadership literature. Yeah. And it includes things like empathy, like being genuinely interested in, in the actual, like, hey, here's, you want a quick measure? Leaders? Pick the top three or four people that are in your group, your organization. Where do they live? Are they married or not? What's the name of the person they're married to? Do they have any kids? What are their names? You can take that metric and predict how good a leader you are. Oh, I see. Could you see why? I mean, if if you're the disinterested, I don't care, don't tell me about it, just get the work person who never asks about your emotional life, your social life. I, I don't mean that you have to go, you know, play bridge with them on Saturdays. I No, I, no you, you can have boundaries, you can have other, but this is a human group. Can you imagine in Aboriginal societies running that tribe the way we run our businesses? Hmm the tribe would fail because the next tribe would come in and kick their ass because you're not going to get the level of cooperation and commitment. There's not as much sort of like, yeah, like dynamic kind of like reciprocity and stuff. Yeah. And multi-level selection would weed it out and has, that's why in our culture, the best of our cultures, mm. the best of our wisdom traditions. So I mentioned that earlier, all these principles are in there, including these new social ones we need, not new, but the ones when you go to that level of analysis, just like when you go to the level of analysis of suborganismic, now we need some new principles. You can't just know about psychological flexibility and know what to do with your liver. You know, you, now it's true. Psychological flexibility will you know, reduce the frequency, how fast your telomeres will shorten, will, you know, help you uh, have epigenetic regulation of stress hormones that are healthy for your life. You'll live longer. You'll, I mean, it's, that's an actual true fact. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you're an expert at the biological level. That has to be worked out also in terms of brains and organ systems and genetics and epigenetics and the same thing socially. So multi-level, multi-dimensional. And that means being humble as psychologists or behavioral science folks, about, but neither expanding nor reducing. Yeah. If anybody wants to say, well, that's just, and they start talking about biology, run away because it's bullshit what well, you're about to be told. Or you don't understand anything until you and expand it to the social, same thing. It's multi-level. Yeah, 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 yeah. Multi-dimensional. Yeah. Complex networks. And that's, uh, science can do it if we can get focused on it properly. We can do this. Mm. We are doing it. We're just doing it way slower than we should. Yeah. And the other question, which actually is very similar, uh, just from some guy called Michael, he says a lot is made of RFT and the concepts of psychological flexibility interventions for individuals and groups. Do you have any thoughts on how it can be applied at broader systemic level in organizations that equal system, systemic level in organizations where outcomes are valued more than processes? I suppose you sort of just answered that. I kind of did, but I want to add here that processes, the way I'm talking about it, are not an endpoint. It comes from a Latin word from the same place we get a procession or parade. It's the same root. It means the sequence of steps. Okay, you're interested in outcomes? What's the sequence of steps? 
Well, if you're not interested in that, you're not going to get the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Do you think they're going to fall from the sky? Is this manna you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. If it's something as a result of your action, your group action, your organization, there's a sequence of steps. What are they? If you're not interested in process, you're not interested in outcome. Yeah. yeah unless yeah. you think manna is going to fall from the sky. And it's okay. So process for its own sake. No, I'm not down with that. That's why, yeah, I get hermeneutics and narrative and all that as a form of appreciation, the participants and the whole and how everything relates to everything else. I'm a contextualist, I get that. But I'm also a prediction and control guy, not because yeah. I'm a mechanist or prediction and influence because control can mean elimination of variability. Why? No, because I'm practical, but you know, people want that. It doesn't, you, the, we can still do understanding and description and appreciation along the journey to and being useful to people in terms of what they want from what they spend their tax dollars on to create these little ivory towers that people like uh, you and me hang out in. Well, okay. So I'm a, the impatience with process comes from the being ripped off by consultants and others who want to yada, 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 yada about some model or theory or something and never cut to the bottom line. Well, what if you would hold to account your measurement, your stats, your interventions to the bottom line? Do you then need process information? And I'd say, yes, you're not, in fact, if you don't have it, all these things we talked about earlier in the conversation can happen. One size fits all can happen. Overextending technology can happen. Failing to appreciate diversity can happen. Or worse things like, oh, we'll appreciate diversity by having like, well, here's how black people are. Here's how gay, oh, no, no, don't do that. Yes, no, about the, but then this person, this person. So I'm frustrated and I, 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 when I hear it, but actually when I get in organizations and I have these meetings all the time, people want to use this kind of stuff. I usually refer people out who are experts and can help them, but I have a conversation to try to understand what they're trying to do. And when we're allowed to have a conversation, almost everybody agrees. Yeah, I do need enough knowledge to know the processes and I do want to put them in there but I don't want it to be a, an endless loop and I want it to be fast and I want it to be accountable to the bottom line. I would say I'm with you. This is a faster journey to the bottom line, faster and more certain and more respectful of the ways that any intervention can go awry. Hmm. Therefore better. <laughs> yeah. Right. Have we exhausted? Boy, I've really given, you know, the reason I've done this for two hours just to explain it, I don't know if this will be edited out, but these are fun questions and I can appreciate your deep interest in it. So, and um, I'm, of course I'm pontificating and stuff, doing what old men do, but uh, I hope there was something in there that was worthwhile to you and those you're serving and your audience. And if they wanna follow me, go to my website, stephenchayes.com and say yes please send it to me and i'll send you a monthly newsletter if you get tired of it single click it goes away i don't spam people it's all pretty safe mm -hmm. and if you're interested in these uh how to turn technology in the direction of what we're talking about with these apps uh you can put it in the notes but they've already or if you've edited out the audio but they've already heard a little bit about it but uh and if, if none of that is applicable a lot of what I'm talking about, you can get in a liberated, a liberated mind. Yes. Not as much as I would like. That was written in 2018. Well, it took me 10 years to write it, but it was published in 2019. And uh, where I'm going, uh, you can get from some of the articles and stuff and eventually the books. But uh, if the deities give me the time to do it. At 75, I have to always add that. Mm. well you, you're looking good for 75 and you know you're sounding good <laughs> you know that's that's you know yeah you kindly missed the name stumbling <laughs> you know 
Uh, snake oil. God dang it. Oh, that happens. That happens to me. I'm 28. That happens to me occasionally. Um, oh, I know. I know. Yeah. But I see. I see the drum beat. I know it's coming after me. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, you know, all I can say is for myself. I mean, uh, firstly, thank you so much for uh, speaking. You know, as as you say, like I just have such a where the interest comes from, even that's interesting, you know, the notion of values, that was a whole, that was a whole sort of path I was going to go down, like this notion of values, do we discover values or do we create values? I mean, I, th I have a sort of my own, oh, take, yeah. you know, but like this kind of like Nietzschean versus sort of Dostoevsky. Oh, yeah, yeah, that would have been a fun one. Yeah, it, yeah. It would be a both and, and a maybe, and it depends kind of the conversation, but yeah, that's a really, really fun one uh, to yeah. You know where where language goes from something that you want to put on a leash to to being able to amplify this yearning for uh, meaning and purpose and uh, for having a say in what you're up to that probably is there just when you hopped out of the womb and started saying not that way, mommy, my way. I don't want to do it your way. You know, you don't have to be very old before you're are on a journey where values eventually becomes a pretty good answer, but. Uh, We'll save that for a later conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so all I can say is, that, yeah, thanks so much, Stephen. Um, I've, yeah, really enjoyed the conversation. And I have no doubt that others will too. Um, because I think, you know, ACT is one of those, and process-based therapies, but perhaps more ACT in the sort of, like the, what we spoke about, perhaps the first hour or so. You know, I think it's one of the, these, um, I've got friends, for example, I know, you know, when they listen to this, it's, Broadly, it's quite this. I know there's a lot of technicalities and technology and things, but it's it's quite simple, really. <laughs> you know, it's it, it's quite simple, and actually, it has so much power to you know help people. Um, yeah, basically, not not experience the when you know Buddhism the second arrow. You know, to sort of not add to their suffering, add to, you know to not pour on that sort of bucket of suffering, and just to sort of like perhaps just make life a little easier um yeah i agree with that and and you know my my uh final thing is a part of takeaway if people find anything useful in here it's easy to find lots of it out there you know if you search for psychological flexibility act etc that's free I, I mentioned even the world health organization and so forth but the other part is i mean your voice and your interest is part of this Maybe not an act qua act, but mm. I hope I've explained that act is really not about act and the normal way that things are, you know, like it's it's not meant as a way of corralling people into a pen and, you know, uh, saying, you know, this is act and you're in it and, you know, mm. don't do that over there. Do that, you know, stay in here, you know, that kind of stuff. So every voice matters, you know, and if people have ideas and are willing to go through, there is a thing. If you want to be part of a tradition, you have to socialize yourself enough to know how to be part of the tradition. If you don't, you can take what's useful over here in whatever tradition you're in, whatever pathway you're on, whatever group you're part of. But the ACT community is a very open community. There's That's permeable boundaries, easily penetrable. And if people see things that are missing or want to be part of that journey, you know, shoot the association for contextual behavioral science contextual science.org you know it ain't just one type of persons that are in that several thousand people who are members all around the world and mm -hmm. and you're not going to find in there the top-down dictator dictatorial here's what you have to be it's really more bottom up here what do what do we want to be so i guess my takeaway would be even beyond that, but this basic spirit needs to be put in our culture, I think, more. Mm. And if there's anything in here that felt reson res that resonant, mm. there's a whole lot of human beings around the planet, probably including living pretty close to you right now, who are in the similar space and are, and are wanting to do that journey as well. And, you know, we're just better as social primates and community that we're all, all by ourselves. So come on in the water's fine and let's see what we can produce together and that's a wonderful place to leave it thank so, you for that change, george 
Yeah, and thank you so much, Stephen. Truly, really, really grateful. Um, and yeah, I mean, what's the time there now? Is it midday? Right here, it's 12.15. I'm going to oh, feed my doggy dog who gets fed at noon. And I know she's sitting right outside that door saying, oh, Dada, where's my food? <laughs> oh, yeah, dogs are amazing. All right, well, I hope you have a lovely day. You too, George. Thanks for the opportunity. Let me know when it's posted or whatever. I keep a list of these things and I'll put it on social media and stuff like oh, that. Brilliant. All right. Thank you so much, Stephen. And yeah, take care. Peace, love, and life. <laughs> yeah. Likewise. Bye. Bye.